So if we think about your patient population and we think about health and longevity, where is it that you see many of us going wrong? Well, I think um, I think of it more through the lens of the medical system uh, than perhaps individual physicians. Um, and I sort of describe this as medicine 2.0, which is the current system that we're we're in. And medicine 2.0 is obviously uh, something that would have followed medicine 1.0, or I wouldn't have called it that. And it's been a remarkably successful evolution in medicine. Uh, and it really solved the jugular problem that our species faced for most of our existence. And that was the problem of fast death. So um, historically, we have died from things that killed us quickly. And that's namely trauma and infections. Uh, and again, we collectively take this for granted today, but as you know, and anyone who's sort of studied the problem realizes, you know, human life expectancy was relatively short, um, you know, shy of 40 years up until about 150 years ago. And again, that was largely the result of having very few tools, if any, to cope with trauma and infection or communicable diseases to be more broad. So something really fundamental happened to shift medicine from this 1.0 to 2.0 about 150 years ago, roughly. And it was I mean, largely sort of three things. One was a new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking was the scientific method, you know, really proposed initially in the late 17th century. I write a little bit about that. Um, but it was this idea that diseases were not caused by the gods and things like that, but were actually caused by things that existed in the world. And obviously, in, in, the, in terms of infectious diseases, that was microscopic organism. The second thing then was the development of the light microscope. This is something that actually Sid Mukherjee has written about very eloquently in his most recent book, The Cell, where he kind of talks about what a pivotal moment that is in medicine when finally scientists and physicians were able to, with their own eyes, see some of these microscopic, microscopic agents. And then, of course, the third piece of that was developing treatments to combat those things. So the development of antibiotics and later on vaccines. Um, so again, these three things you know, basically doubled human life expectancy in a very short period of time. We went from about a life expectancy of 40 to 80 inside of a generation and a half. But here's where we are today. Today, we're at a point where not only has life expectancy flattened, but in many parts of the developed world, it's actually declining a little bit. And the question is why, right? Why is it that life expectancy isn't going up? If anything, it's slightly going down. And more importantly, quality at the end of life is going down. And so it's a long answer to a very simple question you asked, but I think it frames the problem, right? Which is, what should we do about this individually? There is no physician who's out there on the front lines who's taking care of patients who doesn't appreciate that the problem is not that we don't have, you know, better drugs to lower blood pressure or better drugs to lower cholesterol. We do have all of those things, but we're not really in a system that allows us to use those things correctly. And I think the physician uh, also understands that while at a high level, the obvious things are still obvious. For example, it's important to maintain a normal weight, not to have type two diabetes, uh, to be exercising, to sleep well they don't have the training to inform how to do that for a patient. So let, let me kind of give you a glib example. Think about how long it takes to become a medical oncologist, right? So if you finish medical school, at least in the United States, that would be a five or six year postgraduate fellowship after medical school. Now, a person walking down the street who's never gone to medical school knows that a cancer patient needs chemotherapy. They, they, you know, they have, would have some sense that if you have, you know, metastatic colon cancer or breast cancer, you probably need chemotherapy. But of course, the person walking down the street has no idea what chemotherapy they need or how many cycles, how many courses, where it should be placed in proximity to surgery, radiation, what biomarkers you would track 
of that patient as they go into remission and hopefully remain there. That's why the medical oncologist needs five or six years of training to do that. And now think about the fact that every doctor knows exercise is valuable, but how many of them know your VO2 max? How many of them know how many watts you can produce at your aerobic threshold? How many of them know how strong you are? what your appendicular lean mass index is, how you should train to improve those variables, which by the way, have a greater bearing on your lifespan and health span than any other factor we are aware of, inclusive of the absence of or presence of diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, or even smoking. It's, it's a very backward situation if you view it through such a stark lens. The physician truly has no training in how to, at a granular, nuanced, and individual level, help their patient with nutrition, sleep, exercise, yeah. or stress. Yet these things are clearly the most important determinants of our length and quality of life. Yeah, it's fascinating. There has been, I think, a growing movement. You call it Medicine 3.0. In my first book, I called it Progressive Medicine. There's a movement in the UK uh, called Lifestyle Medicine. And I think really all of these different movements are in their own way trying to challenge the status quo and go, wow, listen, we kind of need to update things. We need to improve uh, the tools that we have, think about our education differently. And what's really interesting in what you said there, Peter, is one of the pushbacks often tends to be, well, just well, tell patients to eat better and exercise more and sleep more. Yeah, that's obvious. Any good healthcare professional would already be doing that. And I disagree. A, I don't think any good healthcare professional is doing it for a variety of reasons, including the bias we have in our training towards a particular style of medicine. But as you've just pointed out, with something just, just like exercise alone, there's so much nuance, isn't there, into the type of exercise, the intensity of exercise. What exactly are you exercising for? In the book, you made the case that exercise may well be the most potent longevity intervention that exists. Number one, do you still stand by that since you pressed prints and the manuscript <laughs> went off to the, to the publishers? Uh, and if so, why do you put that right at the top? Uh, the answer to the first question is very simple. Yes, I, I certainly do. Um, and the answer to the second question is also quite simple, which is it really is not a matter of opinion. It is simply a matter of the data. The data make it abundantly clear. I kind of alluded to this a moment ago, but um, maybe for the sake of the audience, we can explain what a hazard ratio is, right? So a, a hazard ratio is a number that um, communicates the relative risk of one condition relative to another. So uh, for example, the hazard ratio associated with all cause mortality for a smoker versus a non-smoker is about 1.4. And so statistically, what that means is a smoker is about 40% more likely to die in any given year than a non-smoker, all other things being equal. That's what the 1.4 means. And you know, if we were to look at something, some intervention, I'm making this up, but, you know, drinking a certain type of tea, if that had a hazard ratio of 0 0.91, we would say that that intervention is associated with a 9% relative reduction in risk. If the hazard ratio is one, it means there's no difference. Okay. So that's, that's the math on hazard ratios. So when you look at the hazard ratios associated with all cause mortality, and of course, all cause mortality is the gold standard of thinking about lifespan. We're going to talk about health span in a moment, but we'll just bracket this on lifespan. Um, let's consider the, the, the known things that rob people of lifespan. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, smoking, end-stage renal disease. Those would be the big ones. What are the hazard ratios associated with each of those conditions? Well, at one end of the spectrum, you'd see hypertension has a hazard ratio of about 1.2. It's about a 20% increase in all-cause mortality, meaning you're 20% more likely in any year to die than someone who's otherwise equal without hypertension. Smoking, as I said, is about 1.4, 1.41. Uh, coronary artery disease, about 1.3. Type 2 diabetes, about the same. 
end stage renal disease about 2.75, somewhere between you know 1.75 and 2.75. So anywhere from a 75 to 175 percent increase. But now when you do the same analysis based on different metrics of cardiorespiratory fitness, strength, and muscle mass, the numbers are simply bigger and they're bigger by a lot. So for example, when you look at comparing the VO2 max of somebody in the bottom 25% of the population for their age and sex. So meaning someone in the bottom quarter of their age and sex in terms of maximal oxygen uptake, which is a test that we can readily do on people. It's a measure of peak aerobic capacity. And you compare that to someone in the top 2% of the same age and sex, the hazard ratio is five, slightly over five, meaning it's a 400% difference in all-cause mortality. In fact, if you just go from being in the bottom 25th percentile to being slightly above average from the 50th to 75th percentile, the hazard ratio difference is 2.75, meaning it's even more significant than having end-stage renal disease. I could go through this analysis all day long, and I could do the same thing for muscle mass, and I could do the same thing for strength, but across the board, the difference in all-cause mortality is significantly wider when it comes to measures of strength and fitness than it is for any disease condition we know. And so the corollary of all of this is, by definition, whatever it is you have to do to have that higher VO2 max, greater muscle mass, and greater strength must be hands down the most potent thing we have at our disposal to live longer. And of course, the only way one can have those things is through the right type of exercise. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. If you just want to shock the system, then your body gets to reset. Um, and, and one of the, the most popular things to do in the longevity world now is 